morning. My name is Alex Padilla. And today I would like to introduce you to our speaker. And our speaker is Robert Lawson from Auburn University. He earned his PhD in economics at Florida State University under the direction of James Gordon. Uh, Dr. Lawson is one of the authors, along with Jim Gordon, of the Economic Freedom of the World Report that has been published since 1996. He's also one of the authors of the blog called Division of Labor that aims to educate into thinking about economics in a daily analysis. And I recommend everybody to go to the website. It's a very excellent blog. Bob was president of the Association for Private Enterprise Education and is also the, currently a member of the Mount Pelerin Society that counts among its numerous members some economic Nobel Prize, uh, including Milton Friedman, Gary Baker, Joseph Ziegler, Vernon Smith. And finally, I would like to add that uh, Dr. Lawson is one of the few individuals that I have the privilege to play tennis with Milton Friedman, who has Nobel Prize in Economics. I think he won the game, but that's because Milton Friedman was 70 years old when he played against him. Uh, so today, Professor Lawson is going to talk to us, discuss with us the importance of economic freedom to the world. Dr. Lawson? Thank you. Thanks, Alex. If it's okay, I'm not going to stand at the uh, podium because I like to run around a little bit. And that's what these things are for. These are really cool. Uh, I have about five of these. Um, there's two parts, right? There's one part that sticks in the computer and the other part. And I have one half of a set for like five different sets. So I, I can never, I never have one of my own. But that's, this is good. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm, it's really happy, I'm really happy to be here. This is actually only my second trip to Denver, which is a crime given that I like to climb mountains also in my spare time and um, hopefully I'll get a chance tomorrow uh, to uh, do something nice uh, outside of town here. Uh, so when Alex invited me I was uh, quick, to, uh, quick to accept the invitation if only so that I could uh, climb a mountain but I have to do a little work beforehand so that I can justify the, uh, the trip to my wife and to my bosses back at Auburn. Um, my students who I, I left uh, you know, without a professor for the rest of the week. I'm going to talk about this Economic Freedom of the World project that Alex mentioned. Uh, this is actually the, the book here. You're welcome to go buy a copy. I get no money if you buy a copy, so it's not a self-interested thing. You could also download it for free, though, so if you want to spend a neat cartridge on it, you're welcome to print out your own. Um, you could probably go to the uh, Metro State Library and print it out on their ink uh, and paper, though. And if the librarians don't catch you, you can probably get away with that. Um, so let's, uh, let's sort of set it up. Uh, here. Um, I'm actually wearing my Adam Smith tie and I'm going to be a little bit, I want to sort of set up the context that we, um, that I, we had in mind when we were thinking about creating the Economic Freedom of the World project that I want to mainly talk about. Um, but the context for it, I think, is this, what I'm calling the Great Debate. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit unfair. I'm kind of using Adam Smith and Karl Marx as straw men. Um, but uh, for better or worse, uh, the great debate that economists and others have had for going on two centuries has been whether we want to have a world that looks like the world Adam Smith advocated or a world that looks like the world Karl Marx advocated. And I'm being a little bit unfair to both Marx and Smith, but it just, it's just sort of a caricature just, just to sort of get the discussion going. Um, Smith's worldview was a world of of private property and freedom of exchange, uh, a world of limited government, um, what today we might call uh, classical liberalism or even libertarianism. Uh, Smith was no anarchist. He did see a role for government, but it was a very minimal role for government. Um, I suppose, I think Smith would be considered a libertarian by today's terminology. Um, Smith basically advocated a system of natural liberty where people should be free to go about their economic lives without much interference from the state. Um, in contrast, uh, Karl Marx, um, and this is, you know, again, a little bit unfair to Marx and what he wrote, but Marx's name anyway has become identified 
with another worldview, a worldview of, of centralized planning, a worldview that, that says people should not be allowed to freely make decisions about economic life. Economic life needs to be controlled with some sort of plan. And the plan uh, inevitably in, in practice has been a plan in, instituted by the government. Uh, so these are the two extreme worldviews. And, and, and in real life, countries all pursue elements of Smith and elements of Marx. But this great debate, what's better? Smith's view of the world or, or Marx's view of the world is sort of an all-consuming debate for 200 years almost. Now, I remember when I was your age, I was a college student at Ohio University in the mid-1980s, and uh, most of you were not alive, um, I, I imagine, but, um, and we would have these debates amongst my friends. Now, I was a very early adopter of the Adam Smith view of the world. I, you know, I, I sort of immediately gravitated towards thinking that made a lot of sense to me, that a world that relied on private property and markets and, and what, what I would call economic freedom was a world that was going to do better and look better and feel better than the other view of the world. But most of my friends were socialists of some stripe or another, or Democrats at least. And, um, and I'm not sure that there's much of a difference anymore. That's another discussion. Um, and, uh, and these were good friends of mine, and we would have these wonderfully intellectually stimulating debates with the assistance of liquid courage deep into the evening. Um, and it was wonderful fun, and it, my, some of my best memories of college were arguing these deep philosophical, political, political philosophy questions and economic questions. Um, but one of the things that dawned on me uh, as I was getting older and turning into a graduate student and learning to become a professional economist is that the debate ultimately took us nowhere. I, I cannot remember a single one of my socialist friends who I convinced that I, uh, that I was right. And likewise, none of them made any headway on me. So we had these wonderfully stimulating debates, but you know, if you think about debating as being some sort of search for truth, it sure as heck wasn't getting us there. We were arguing and enjoying the argument, but it wasn't really getting us uh, to a resolution like you think a debate's supposed to. Okay? And it got me to thinking as I was in grad school and I was working with Jim Gortney, uh, as a graduate student, he was my professor. The, I said, how would this sort of thing work if it was a natural sciences debate? What if we were two chemists? What if you had two chemists? And one chemist said, well, I have a, a theory, and I've got some calculus, or I've got some analytical chemistry formulas here. If you know, I don't know anything about chemistry, but go with it. And I think that if you mix these two chemicals together, it will smell like roses. We'll have this wonderful aroma of roses. And another chemist, a similarly skilled analytical chemist, says, my, I've got my formulas, my chemistry, my, my theory of the way these things works, says if you mix those same two chemicals together, you're going to get a smell of rotten eggs. And these two chemists would argue with each other. No, no, my equations. See, my equations are right. And the other guy says, no, 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 your equations are crap. My equations are right. And would, th would these two guys just argue and argue every night, night after night, for years and years? about whose, whose equations were right. Now what are they going to do? They're going to go to the lab, they're going to mix the two chemicals, and they're, they're either going to smell like roses, or smell like rotten eggs, or smell like neither, and they're both wrong, but they're going to settle this debate like scientists. They're going to settle it with an appeal to empirical evidence. All right. And ultimately, this economic freedom of the world project that I want to talk about with you today is an attempt to settle the great debate, or at least advance the great deba debate a little further, not along philosophical grounds, but along empirical grounds. Okay? If Smith is right, uh, then countries or places that look like Smith's worldview will smell like roses. And if Marx is right, places that look like uh, uh, Smith's worldview will smell like rotten eggs. We should be able to tell. Uh, in practice, countries pursue different types of economic arrangements, and we should be able to look at the performance and the results in those places to see if they're going to, if they work, if the, which ones work better. So let's leave the philosophical debating about justice and, and morality and ethics aside for a moment, and let's just act like we're chemists and do some empirical uh, analysis. So that's the sort of setting point for the for the for the talk and the project. Um, so let's talk about measuring economic freedom. 
And by economic freedom, I'm, I'm, this is the term that I, we are using to basically describe Adam Smith's view of the world. It's a world of, where people primarily have private property as opposed to, say, state or commonly owned property. Uh, it's a world where people are free to trade with other people without interference in terms of price controls or other regulatory controls. Uh, it's a world where uh, you can start a business, you can compete with other people who have businesses. It's sort of a classical liberal free market framework. Um, and we want to measure this. And it's pretty complicated. It's complex. Uh, you might say, well, how are you going to measure freedom? It's kind of, kind of a fuzzy concept, right? Well, you know, it, it is fuzzy, uh, but uh, I'm a big fan of measuring things. Um, uh, you, you know, if you don't, you've all studied, G, some of you anyway, most of you I suspect have studied GDP, gross domestic product, in your econ classes. You know, that's a pretty fuzzy concept, too. All of the things we make in a year. Well, think about that. All the things we make, haircuts, mowing grass, cars, washing dishes, prostitutes selling sex. There's a lot of stuff being produced in this economy. It's a big, complicated, fuzzy blob of stuff. And what do, what do the national accountants do? They boil it down to a number, $12 trillion or something. Okay. So yeah, it's complicated. Yes, it's a little fuzzy. But it's really not that much more fuzzy, in my opinion, than GDP, uh, where we try to put a number on the production of all the people in the United States for a year. That's, a, that's an incredibly complicated task. Okay. Um, so let's talk about how we do it. Uh, I won't bore you too much with the methodology. Um, you're welcome to get the book. Uh, it's, it's not an exciting read, um, if you can see that. Uh, this is not something you... Um, it's just numbers. It's just no pages, pages of numbers. It's extremely dull. Um, what we do is we collect data. I collect data. Um, my Jim, Jim Gortney is actually blind, completely blind. So as you can imagine, he's not very much help when it comes to collecting the data. Um, I, I, I should mention, though, that he's, he catches typos really well because he has the computer that reads to him. And, and when, it, when, the computer, when there's a typo, the computer sends like a buzz, like beep because it doesn't know what the word is or something. And, and so he's actually the best proofreader I've ever found is send him to a blind man. It's funny. Um, so we collect data on 141 countries. We use 42 different pieces of data, 42 different variables. They actually get grouped into five areas. And I'll describe the five areas next. But you probably don't want me to go through all 42 of them. We'll be here for the next three hours. Uh, I, I can if you want. But I suspect you'll get your extra credit if we do this in 50 minutes or 40 minutes or something. Um, Okay, right, there you go. I get paid the same whether I take, you know. Okay. So we have zero to 10 ratings at the end of the day. Uh, we get 42 pieces of data, eight er or five areas, and everything gets converted to zero to tens. Tens are good. Uh, good. Tens are Adam Smith's worldview. Zeros are Karl Marx's worldview. And if you're a Marxist, uh, good for you. Uh, you can invert that and make the, you, I don't care, it's just a scale, okay? <laughs> Uh, but I'm a, I'm a, I like Smith, so in my, I, I did the index. We're making the big numbers better, okay? Uh, we use third-party data, but I, by that I mean I don't sit in my office in Auburn, Alabama, which is not exactly the most cosmopolitan place on earth, and I don't sit there and make up numbers for, you know, Myanmar and Namibia and so forth. I collect data from uh, evil international organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, some private organizations like the World Economic Forum out of Switzerland, um, IMD is another group in Switzerland. PricewaterhouseCoopers provides me with some tax rate data. So I just collect data from a multitude of different sources. Uh, and the entire exercise is me combing through books. Thank goodness for the internet now. I mostly have to, I can get this stuff electronically. I don't have to type it in anymore like I used to. And it all gets put into my huge spreadsheet. It's about 15 meg spreadsheet. Uh, and uh, out comes a number. So if, you know, it's sort of a big sausage factory. The good news is in the index, or in the book, every detail that I could document about how the index is constructed, where the data come from, how you get from the raw data to the zero to tens, how the, the 42 components average up to the big number at the end, all of that's described. Transparency is a really high part of our project. When Jim and I set out to do this, we didn't want the index that we created to be a black box that you would just open up and you'd see a number, four, 4.2 or something. And, where that number come from? We wanted everybody to be able to see exactly how we got the final numbers we got. We may have done something wrong 
you may disagree with some of the way, but we, did, we, we wanted at least everybody to know how we did the numbers. And uh, what, what I'd like to be able to say is that I could give one of you the assignment to replicate the index. If you, if, if you simply had the same recipe that we, we described, you should be able to go do it yourself, collect the data and put it together yourself. Um, so it wasn't a, a beauty contest where Jim and I sat there and sort of, hmm, I think El Salvador is doing better this year. It wasn't, it's nothing like that. If El Salvador's number is better this year than last, last year, it's because the underlying data that we pull got better, okay? So it's not a beauty contest. I get a lot of criticism. We could talk about that maybe in Q&A, but some of the criticisms we've gotten. People say, how'd you rate it? So I didn't rate it. I kind of, I'm just the messenger. I just collect the data and we put it, we present it in a, a, a usable, um, coherent form. Uh, these are the five areas. It's worth just describing them briefly. The um, first one is basically how big is the government in a fiscal sense. Um, when governments tax us, they make us less free. That doesn't mean taxes are always and everywhere bad, but when governments take our money, we can't spend it. So our, our freedom has been uh, diminished. The second area is legal property rights, basically. We have uh, uh, seven different components in area two from three different sources. And they're all survey-based, really, where we have uh, international surveys that ask people how secure property rights, how, uh, how, long, how many days does it take to settle a contract dispute, for example, something like that. How efficient is the court system, which is a, a critical part of the efficient operation of private property. The third area is uh, money and inflation, basically, is how much of a risk is it that the government's going to steal your money by, uh, by a, via an inflation tax? And then uh, the fourth area is international trade freedom. It's basically free trade. Tar low tariffs and quotas get you better numbers. Um, there's also capital controls. And lastly, different types of regulations. There's a lot of things. Area 5 has 15 or 14 components, 14 components. Everything from interest rate controls to price controls generally to minimum wages, which is an infringement on labor market freedom to uh, mandatory severance pay, uh, all kinds of things. How, uh, difficulty, how many days does it take to start a business? If it takes a long time to start a business because of government red tape, people are, uh, are less, less free. So there's a lot of things in Area 5, although it's, um, it's, well, it's, 120, it's, it's one fifth of the index, it's 20% of the index, but okay. So 42 pieces of data, all of them put into sort of content areas, five areas. The five areas ultimately are averaged up uh, with equal weighting, because I don't know how else to do it, um, and we get a number. Ready? Who's number one? Sweden. Uh, not Sweden's not that bad. Uh, Hong Kong's number one. Hong Kong's number one, always has been number one. We've been doing this index for, well, since 96, but we actually have data back to, to 1970. Hong Kong has been number one since the beginning. Every year we've done it. They will be number one for a long time in, in the foreseeable future. Um, Singapore is number two, uh, and that raises a very significant point. This is a narrowly defined economic freedom index. It deliberately avoids political freedoms and civil liberties. And Singapore, of course, is not highly, highly regarded as a place for civil liberties. I think you have the death penalty for, for drug possession, and um, there's, the, the elections are sham, if they even have them. Uh, so, uh, so this illustrates the point that this is an economic freedom uh, measure in the narrow sense, and it doesn't discuss the political and civil liberties regime that may exist. There are other indices out there that do those already, so we didn't feel the need to, to sort of get involved in that, that, that measurement issue. The rest of the countries are all pretty much understandable. Chile is now in the top 10, and that's a relatively recent uh, uh, development. They've been rising uh, through the 80s um, and now have cracked into the top 10 quite, uh, quite significantly. Okay. The United States is down to eighth, by the way, uh, tied for eighth, and uh, they were as high as second once. In the year 2000, uh, when George Bush took office, they were uh, second, and when George Bush left office, they were eighth. Um, so, um, I have an op-ed that blames George Bush for destroying, or not destroying, but for reducing our economic freedom. I don't know if it was entirely fair to the former president, but uh, it was a good op-ed. Um, <laughs> Now, there's 142 countries, uh, or one country, it's way too many to put up here. You, you wouldn't be able to be like a negative four-point font or something. Uh, but uh, here's a, uh, a list of some of the larger countries that are most, most significant countries that are out there. Um, 
Sweden's score is uh, reasonably high. I get a lot of questions about Sweden because for a long time, Sweden was regarded as sort of the iconic socialist welfare state of Europe. But the reality is that Sweden is a market economy. Private, private property dominates the landscape. Yes, they have brutally high taxes. But other than high taxes, what is, how, how different is Sweden from the United States? Private property, just like the United States. In fact, probably better, more efficient court system in Sweden than we have in the United States. What about money and inflation? Eh, it's about the same. They're about as stable and secure in their monetary area as we are. Maybe even a little bit better. What about free trade? They're actually a little bit better. Regulations? It depends. If you talk about labor regulations, they're worse, but in other, a lot of other regulations in Sweden are less severe than they are in the United States. So when you kind of put it all together and net it out, Sweden's got higher labor market regulations and worse taxes, a lot worse taxes in the United States, but everything else is pretty much the same. They're, not, they're a market economy that has high taxes. So they come in about 33rd um, out of 141. That's, that's not bad. Uh, it's really kind of incorrect to put Sweden up there as some kind of great, uh, where the government controls everything. They take a lot of taxes from people. But other than that, it's pretty much a free, free economy, except for the point, that, except, for the, except on tax day, right? Okay? So they don't do as well as the low tax countries like the United States or Hong Kong or the United Kingdom, uh, but uh, they don't do too badly, okay? Compared uh, Sweden, though, to India, which is, not, which is going up because there's a lot of Indian economic reforms, but India is 77th. You can't do anything in India without a government permission. You can't open up a, a, a business. You can't, uh, you know, nothing happens in India, India without deep government control throughout the, throughout the day. Uh, and so it's, you know, Sweden is a socialist country compared to Switzerland is nowhere near socialist. Yes, uh, Italy's uh, in that sort of um, Japan area there. They're a little lower. They're like in the late, low 20s, I think. Okay. Maybe they're as low as 40, but um, maybe they're around. They might be as low as France, but I think they're a little higher than France. France has been, sorry, Alex. Well, that's why you left, right? You, you, so, uh, but France has been, been going south uh, pretty bad. China's moving up. The problem with China is that it's a country of about a billion people. About 300 million of them are living in free market capitalism, like Hong Kong type situation, like Shanghai and so forth. Um, and then about 800 million of them are living in a tight totalitarian dictatorship. So when, you net, when I sort of look at it overall, China still gets a very low rating. But it's hard to rate China because our methodology gives one country one number. But China internally has everything from the freest places like Shanghai to the absolute sort of worst most tightly controlled, you know, go to outer Mongolia where you can't, again, you can't do anything without the local commissar or whatever they call him in China, uh, 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 without his permission. Um, so it's a little bit of a strange uh, situation. It's, it's a question mark, really, in my mind as to how sustainable that is uh, internally. Uh, Russia's a disaster. Uh, uh, Venezuela, another disaster. Venezuela was, I think, as high as 17th in the world once, and now they're almost dead last, thanks to Chavez. Uh, and Zimbabwe, you don't, you don't really need to pay a lot of attention to the world news to know what a disaster Zimbabwe is, a tragedy. Uh, Zimbabwe arguably was one of the highest functioning and richest African countries, and um, people are literally starving now, literally starving. Uh, it, was, it was an exporter of food 15 years ago, and today people are starving uh, to death. I mean, it's just unbelievable turn of, turn of affairs, and they're actually dead last in the index. And, um, uh, and if they could go lower, if there were more countries in the index, they'd be lower. Uh, I don't have Cuba. They're 142. Uh, I don't have them in the index because I don't have data for Cuba. I don't have North Korea. They're 143. <laughs> I know that, but I, I, I could put them in by, by sort of by, by fiat. I could just make them go in. But again, our rules were if you don't have data, you don't get into the index. So places like North Korea, which are so tightly controlled to the point where they don't even have data. Same thing, by the way, with Saudi Arabia. One of the oil countries that we don't have is Saudi Arabia because they're so closed that it's actually difficult to get quality data um, out of Saudi Arabia. Um, if you have questions about specific countries, I probably can answer it off the top of my head, but a, I don't have them memorized, and that's why I bring the book with me, though, so it's, it's all there. Um, that's a little hard to see. Is there, 
a way to do lights at all? Can, uh, yeah, that's not it. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, there, that's a little bit better. Thanks. Um, it's a little hard to see. The cover of the book has a, a map, a color map, and um, it's kind of nice to look at sort of by color the distribution of the economic freedom map there. Uh, blue is, uh, is, is basically the upper 25%. Uh, green is sort of the, the second 25%. Uh, yellow is the third. And then red uh, is the sort of lowest 25%. There's some interesting things you'll see. One of the starkest contrasts is, uh, is Argentina and Chile. Uh, you know, Chile is in the top 10. Argentina is deep red. Uh, and uh, Chileans and Argentinians hate each other, of course. Uh, I mean, they don't hate, but yeah, they don't like each other. Um, and so that's uh, interesting. I, had, I gave that, this talk, almost exactly the same talk, to a group of businessmen once, and this guy says, oh, I, can't, I wish I had known that. He worked for Home Depot, and he says, you know, we, we built 20 stores in Argentina, and within two years, they, we had to close every one of them down uh, because we just couldn't, couldn't uh, get through the government uh, uh, red tape and the, and the corruption. Uh, and he says, we didn't, we didn't go into Chile at all. I said, well, I, I'm, this is not investment advice, but if I were an investor, I'd, <laughs> I'd avoid the red countries myself. Uh, the uh, greens, you, know, you can see Southern Africa doing well. South Africa has actually been improving a little bit, and Botswana is, is in green. You can't really distinguish them. Uh, they're doing quite well. Um, they're, one of my favorite countries is right here. It's blue. Anyone know what, what country that is? It's Georgia, yeah. I was, uh, Georgia is the fastest economic reforming country in the world. Uh, you know, of course, they were a former Soviet uh, uh, republic. Um, and so in 1990, they were part of the Soviet Union. And today, uh, I think they're ranked in the t low 20s in the index. They've come farther. Estonia is actually the, the other one. But uh, Georgia, in the last 10 years, has made the most rapid reforms away from Marx's vision and towards Smith's vision. Uh, I've been to Georgia a number of times, so I've got a sort of personal attachment to the place. I was actually there during the Russian invasion um, in August of last year. I'm going again this August, and if they invade again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going back. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, there was nothing between where I was and, and the Russian army except like one Georgian cop. You know, <laughs> he parked his car across the road. That was our, you know, that was it for, um, well, thankfully they didn't come, but um, anyway. Uh, so there's, there's some really neat things going on. In this, the breakup of the Soviet Union is sort of the biggest event in this, this, sort, of con this sort of debate. Uh, and you see Georgia and Estonia in blue, and then you see Ukraine in, in, in red. I mean, you see some of them really, really moving towards Adam Smith, to use my, my, my debate metaphor, and some of them just sort of circling and staying where they, where they came from. It's, the contrasts are, are stark. The economic performance, the results are also quite stark, as Estonia uh, and, and, and Georgia have put up extremely rapid growth rates. Even Georgia's growth rate this year, despite the Russians, um, is, I think, going to be 6% in a context of uh, not too many countries growing at all, if, if, so it's very good. Um, okay, let's talk about whether, uh, about the, um, you probably already figured out the answer to the, to, the, to the question, but at the end of the day, the reason we built the index was because we wanted to ask some basic questions, and, and we can do this in a sophisticated way with econometrics if you'd like, but I don't think this is the time or place to go over regression results and T-statistics and R-squares and things like that. Unless you want, I can pull them up, but you probably don't. Uh, so we're just going to look at some basic data, mostly telling the story that, that um, I think we've learned. And, and a lot of this stuff I, I think we already knew. Uh, so the, most of the charts that we're going to present have uh, break up the world into those uh, quarters, uh, quartile, I should say quarter really, but the first 25%, the second 25% group, the third and the fourth. And then you get the average within each group. And so this is the average level of income. It's GDP per capita measured in purchasing power parity dollars, if you care. Uh, the average uh, income per person in the top three quartile, is, most three quartiles, about 30,000. And it's about one ninth of that in the lowest quartile. It's a very, uh, something I think most of us knew. But you know, this, is not, this was not obvious to my friends in 1985. Uh, in 1985, when I was a college student, 
it was a legitimate debatable question as to whether or not market-oriented societies would be more productive or less productive than command and control and regulated economies. People, smart people, um, Paul Samuelson, Nobel Prize winning economist, smart people claimed that centrally planned, regulated, government-run economies could outperform market economies. I think that is complete, I thought it was wrong then, but now I'm pretty doggone sure it's wrong. The data don't back that up at all. Uh, it's a very, very strong relationship. Uh, this is one way of showing it. You can show it other ways. But uh, bottom line is places that look like Adam Smith's worldview are richer than places that look like Marx's worldview. The economic growth thing is a little bit more, more difficult there because growth, the growth process is more, uh, that growth is how quickly you're getting richer. Uh, it's more complicated, but there's a recent survey by a guy in Dahan, uh, named Dahan who I don't like, by the way, but I, I quote him because he, I like, he's, he's right on this. Um, that is, uh, economic freedom has a positive relationship with growth. He, he surveyed like 30 articles, and all 30 of them had the same result. Uh, that uh, it looks like countries that are freer are also growing more rapidly. So they're richer and they're growing more rapidly as well. And that, that's a result that uh, is a little harder to show with a graph, but because you really need to do those regressions to show that, um, I'm afraid. Um, this is uh, the fallback position. My, my socialist friends, if I ever cornered them, I would, I would, sometimes you'd get one of my socialist friends to, 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 to say, yeah, you're right, Lawson. Markets, they do seem to be a little bit more productive. It does look like market economies are richer than command and control economies and regulated economies. I, I, I'll concede that. But, here's the but. The but is, but market economies screw the poor. There's too much inequality of income, right? That's the, that's the fallback position for my socialist friends. They may admit that market economies are productive, but then they'll say, but they're unfair. They're, they're, there's too much inequality. So um, again, a number of ways to show this. My favorite way is this way. This is the income held by the lowest 10%. If you look at the bottom 10% of any society, you can ask, what share of all income does the bottom 10th earn? And uh, what do you see there? There's not a lot there. The bottom line is income inequality exists all over the globe. And you can look at all the countries in the world, and you're going to find basically the bottom tenth of the population earning somewhere between 2 and 3 percent, 1.5, maybe 3.5 percent of total income. It doesn't matter whether you're in a market economy or, or a planned, centrally planned, regulated economy. It seems that there's inequality and it runs, it's everywhere. Some places have less inequality than others, but the key is it doesn't correlate at all with whether you're a market economy or not. So it's simply not true that market economies are dramatically less equal in the distribution of income than non-market economies. And you can, you can show this with other data like Gini coefficients and so forth. Uh, uh, I use this because it's easier for most people who don't know economics to understand what a, the tenth is, or Gini coefficients, you know, that unless you've had a class and know what that is, it's not so easy to, to, to explain that to a journalist, for example, what a Gini coefficient is. Um, so it's not true that market economies have more inequality. It's simply not true. I think it's a lie. You hear it a lot, though. You hear it a lot, and it's just, I think it's not true. There is one thing that I do know is true, that if you are in the lowest, if you are in the bottom tenth of the, po of the population, uh, you, you're better off being in the bottom tenth in a free country, because the bottom tenth in a free country is also going to be most likely in a richer country. So this is the income level of the people in the bottom tenth. The income level of the people in the bottom tenth is, uh, uh, is $8,000 in that top group versus about 900 in the bottom group. In the United States, the, the bottom tenth of the population in the United States, despite income inequality in the United States being what it is, earns, I think, about $12,000 per person uh, for people in the lowest tenth of the population. Um, that's not great. I would much rather be rich than poor, but I guess I'd rather ha be, um, um, I'd rather have $12,000 than $961, you know. Um, okay. My favorite chart is this one. Um, economists are, are criticized, uh, c c accurately, uh, just, uh, justly criticized for emphasizing numbers and dollars. And you, I started off with dollars, GDP per capita, growth rates, you know. Um, 
This is life expectancy from birth, uh, on average for the four groups. Uh, you can see it's, it's an extremely sharp uh, relationship. Probably is just reflecting income, but nevertheless, this illustrates that we're not just talking about dollars and cents here. We're talking about how long you live, for example. And living 79 years versus living 58 years, you know, that's the difference between, knowing, between seeing your grandchild get married or not. Uh, and that's, a, that's not just dollars and cents. That's not whether you, you have a car in the, in, the, in the driveway. That's whether you get to watch your granddaughter get married. Um, in a lot of places in the world, you are dead, statistically, before your grandchildren grow up. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge human loss to so many people around the world. Um, and it runs with economic freedom. Um, probably, again, this is reflecting income. Richer countries can buy more health care and refrigeration and all kinds of things, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it, it puts a more human face on it uh, than dollars and cents. Um, notwithstanding my mountain climbing fetish, I'm, uh, I don't claim to be much of an environmentalist, um, um, but I, I appreciate, I understand there are people out there who, who place high value on the environment. Uh, this is an environmental performance index. Um, some group, some left-wing commie pinko group. Uh, I'm exaggerating, I know. Uh, uh, okay, well, I apologize. Um, some group, I think it's at Columbia University, uh, puts out this environmental performance index. They uh, do a 0 to 100 scale. Higher numbers are better. They, um, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. It's everything from air pollution to... Um, to land and water pollution and, and different things. Uh, and I just on a whim threw this in. And again, I think this is reflecting income more than anything else. But places that have more economic freedom have better economic environmental performances uh, on average. The, um, again, mostly, again, probably reflecting higher income. Uh, higher places that are more productive can afford water treatment plants and scrubbers and uh, catalytic converters in their cars and, and a number of other things. And, 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 uh, and poorer countries simply, simply can't. So again, uh, I don't think this is directly causal, but it's reflecting the fact that, you know, it's, it's not obviously the case that market-oriented economies and rich economies are, have worse performance environmentally. And some things they probably do, but aren't, in general, they generally don't. And that's the, the result from that. There are a few academic studies that have come out recently. A friend of mine named Mike Stroop uh, has a few papers on this uh, showing that same thing. Now, this, is a, this takes a little of explaining. This is political rights and civil liberties. Uh, I mentioned that our index doesn't include democracy, freedom to own a, a party, um, or freedom to, to you know, enter politics, freedom of speech, religion, so forth. Uh, there's a group called Freedom House in New York, which does indexes along those lines. I should mention that their index is kind of, I think it's backwards. For them, lower numbers are better. And I guess I could have inverted it but to make it run like the other charts. But, but so lower numbers mean better democracy, better political freedom, better civil liberties. Okay, so this is, this is the, the pattern here is the one I, I hope to show, right? I hope to show that more economic liberty, there's not a great trade-off. The bottom line is not a great trade-off. If you're going to pursue a market economy, you don't have to give up your democracy. You don't have to give up your civil liberties. Singapore stands out as, a, as one of the countries that's really off the charts. They're very high on our economic freedom index, but fairly low, especially on the, uh, the in, in the, both of these political rights and civil liberties index. But Singapore is an outlier. There just aren't that many cases. Most countries that are free economically also pursue relatively liberal political and civil regimes. Um, there have been other examples of, of weird cases. Chile, of course, uh, began its economic reforms under Pinochet, who was no liberal. Um, and so you have other examples like that. Uh, but you also have cases of, of liberal regimes politically, like India, that have been pretty tightly, on, tightly controlled economically. So, there are exceptions, but the general pattern is quite strong. Democracy and economic freedom basically go together. Uh, there's no great conflict, in, at least in the aggregate, uh, between those two. Uh, this is a different chart. I just copied this out of one of our annual reports from 2005. Um, there's a, college, a, a guy at UCSD, Eric Gartsky is his name. He's a top political scientist. I think US, UCSD might be the number one rated PhD program in political science. Um, and he is there, um, and he studies war. Um, and they have these wonderful databases in political science. First of all, they have some definition of war. I think it, to a political scientist, war is, 
uh, when two nation states have a, have, a, have a conflict and something like 1,000 people die, that's a war. I think it's the sort of textbook political science you know, definition. And so the, he's got, you know, there's hundreds of countries in the world, and so there's, there's all these opportunities. Countries can go to war, and they've, some of, most of them don't. Most of the, if you look at you know, country pairs, it's usually zero. There's no war. U.S. and Canada, zero, no war. Uh, U.S. Iraq, ah, one. They got a war. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, so he he has this huge database uh, over time, looking at the propensity of two nations, nation pairs, to fight. They call them dyads, to go to fight a, a war. And uh, he he looks at the index of economic, our index of economic freedom. And as you go, the, the black line is the main line, uh, the dark line. As you go from less economic freedom to more, the probability of having a military conflict dro drops dramatically. Okay. Uh, one of the competing hypotheses in political science was what, what political scientists call the, the capitalist peace hypothesis. You may have studied that if you take international relations in political science. And the capitalist peace hypothesis is difficult to describe in 30 seconds, but basically it says democracies are not as warlike as non-democracies, uh, especially against each other, okay, so roughly speaking. It's basically, democracies don't fight wars as much as non-democracies. That's not entirely the, the precise way that they talk about it, but that's close enough for us. And so one of the things that Eric was interested in is, is what's the difference between economic freedom, economic liberalism, uh, as a... Um, predictor of the probability of going to war. And you see here that I mean, more economic freedom means a fairly quick drop in the probability of, of a conflict. What is it if you look at capitalism? Uh, or excuse me, what if you, if you look at democracy? And that's basically a flat line. And, and this is the sort of shocking result for Eric. And he is a political scientist. And as you, if you know, political scientists sort of like democracy. It's kind of the, it's the holy grail for political scientists. Uh, and he's actually gotten a lot of heat and a lot of criticism from colleagues because he's daring to say that maybe what we thought was democratic peace was really capitalist peace. Maybe it really was that free market economies are less warlike uh, versus, um, uh, and maybe it's not so much a, an effect of democracy as such. Yeah, there's, there's two competing, there is a literature on both sides, though. Uh, in the, in the uh, well, a lot of the socialist critics of capitalism argued that capitalism was, was, was inherently warlike. That the, you know, you could sort of in the, in the 20th century, the sort of the idea of the military industrial complex that markets and economies would be warlike. So there was an element that there were, there, you know, the old socialists, you know, the sort of the old style socialists oftentimes argued that socialism was going to be peaceful and capitalism was warlike. Uh, and on the other hand, there's also in the classical liberal tradition, there's a long tradition that argued the opposite, that, that trading, you know, trade, traders don't fight wars with each other. And so there is actually arguments on both sides. Um, anyway, we're now trying to get some empirical uh, resolution to that. This is really a, one of my favorite papers because, uh, again, it's not dealing with dollars and cents and economic growth. It's talking about something like war. Um, um, <clears throat> so it's pretty cool. Okay, last, uh, I think last, the website that is uh, some marketing genius at the, at the Fraser Institute, which is our publisher, came up with this, I really dislike it, uh, the freetheworld.com. I really think it sounds cheesy, but um, anyway, that's our website. Um, and you can go there and you can download the book. You can download the data if you're taking econometrics or, or data analysis type class. Uh, there's a wealth of data that you can download and play with, uh, run regressions or whatever it is you do. Um, uh, you can also download the previous reports. One thing I'll put a plug in is that each report has a special topic chapter. This last year's report had a chapter on poverty. So if you're really interested in poverty, there's a chapter on that. Uh, last year we had one on foreign aid written by Bill, Bill Easterly. Uh, we had the one on war written, written, written by Gartsky. So each year there's a topical chapter that, that accompanies the, uh, the, the data. Uh, the reason we do that actually is because the data are pretty much the same every year, some changes. So we needed to put a topical chapter in the book every year to give somebody a reason to check it out every, every year. 
Um, but that's become a, uh, everybody's all, it's becoming a kind of a big deal now. Everybody's kind of interested in what the next topic is. Um, the next, this year's topic is, uh, you might not be surprised to learn, is the financial crisis and economic freedom. Some topical chapters on that. Okay. And I think that's it. I'll just leave the map up for now. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Lawson is going to take questions. Um, when you did the war data, did you take into account the size of any country's military or only whether they had been experiencing wars? Uh, because I think that that could have implications on whether they were experiencing war also. I'd have to go back and look at the chapter. Uh, there were other control variables in the study, um, a variety of control variables. Um, I think he used some of the normal ones like ethno-linguistic fractionalization. Proximity is a variable, actually. Countries that, you know, New Zealand is not likely to fight a war with Luxembourg, if only because it'd be, ta it'd be logistically difficult, you know. Uh, so, you know, there, so there, were, there were control variables in there. I don't know about size of military or, or, or whatnot. Um, that, um, uh, that's an interesting question. One of my favorite countries is Botswana which spent the first 25 years or so of its existence without a national uh, army. And I'm intrigued by nations who simply say we're not going to have an army. And surprisingly, no one invaded them. I mean, Zimbabwe or South Africa could have just rolled the tanks up and taken them anytime they wanted. There was nothing to stop them, but no one did. So um, it's kind of an interesting example. Uh, probably need to go to the microphone, though. I'm okay. I speak loud enough. You guys can hear me, right? Well, I think it's being taped. That's the only issue. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Although I can repeat the question, too. I was just wondering if you uh, took a look at intrastate disputes versus uh, interstate yeah. disputes and the possibility of, uh, of a country having an intrastate dispute. Right. Yeah, I know there are data on that. I, don't, I haven't seen a study on it. That's the short answer. There are, there, are, there are people that study what common people call civil wars, but um, I haven't seen one that used economic freedom anyway. And again, since I'm really an economist, I don't really follow the political science literature as closely as I ought, I guess. But it'd be a great question to look at. Okay. Thanks for coming out here. Um, I just have one question. You said uh, your new subject uh, this year is going to be on the financial crisis. And I was just wondering if uh, I've read some certain papers, especially some of our teachers around here have talked about things like Islamic banking and some of the merits of the double assets. Um, falling and rising in terms of people actually invest, banks taking investment strategies in businesses. And if, if you followed any line and then come to any conclusions on um, the instability of our financial banking structure versus Islamic banking structures. Wow. I'm teaching financial markets and banking right now, but I don't think I, I, I've really not thought about it, Islamic banking. I can tell you that in the context of the uh, Economic Freedom Index, it's a little bit of a challenge for example, there's, uh, for example, one of our variables deals with um, interest rate controls. Well, in a nominal sense, Pakistan, for, or you know, Oman, better, better example. There's no interest. There's no such thing as interest, technically. Now, we all know what happens in Islamic banking. They get around it by calling it a fee or some other, you know, some other way of doing it. Uh, you, you treat everything like a discount bond or something. There are all kinds of ways around it without calling it interest. So it turns out it, in the index, it actually surprisingly doesn't really hurt them. That type of banking structure doesn't hurt them in the area where we, we deal with credit market regulations. Um, but I haven't really studied the details on sort of how the balance sheet of an Islamic restructured bank would be versus an American commercial bank. Um, um, I really haven't thought about it. I should, though. I'm teaching that now. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think Zimbabwe was like last on your list and their inflation rate is like some 500 million percent or something like that. Right. So um, is it true that that was really only 20% of the uh, factor for them? Yeah. What are the other factors for that? Well, they get a, they get a low rating in every, every area. Zimbabwe gets a low rating in every area, really. Uh, I mean, it's obviously the, the recent inflation is um, the, the thing that gets the headlines. 
but uh, I mean, prior to that, the the ejection of, of landowners. I mean, you should see their property right area too. Their property right ratings are just, I mean, as low as any country in the world. Um, the uh, price controls, uh, which is related to the inflation question, but uh, when they put in the price controls, the store shelves went bare in, in two days. I mean, there's nothing left on the stores, which is what you get when you do price controls at that of that type. Um, so it's really an across-the-board phenomenon. Um, it, and again, it's what's shocking about it is how, at least in a comparative sense, Zimbabwe would have been considered a high-functioning liberal regime, uh, economically and politically, at least by African standards, which isn't saying a lot maybe, but uh, and how, how that has completely come undone in a, in a short period of time. Um, I've recently encountered some, some wonderfully shocking quotes about Mugabe. Uh, from when, just after he took office, and um, he he didn't go insane right away either. But uh, the um, uh, the fact is, uh, early on, he was considered to be a, you know a sort of a cosmopolitan liberal who's going to you know not get embroiled in the the, the tribal you know ism that had hurt a lot of African countries. And of course, it all has turned out horribly wrong. But, um, Yes. Do you have data or conclusions that shed any light on differences between a democratic or Adam Smith model <coughs> or a Marxist model in dealing with the pressures of extraordinary population growth? How different societies might respond? Right. Um, I no. I really haven't thought about it. Um, no. Short answer is no. I don't. I have an opinion, maybe, uh, but it, uh, population growth uh, is really only a big problem when you're in a regulated state that, uh, that makes it difficult for the economy, the economic growth process to match the pace of the population growth. Including um, um, so, services, things like that. Um, and it seems like there's a tipping point in some of what may have appeared to be thriving socialist economies as the population of people needing services right. exceeds by a certain factor those who are producing right. the revenues to generate the services. Right. Um, yeah, the demographic problems that face a lot of countries are severe. I just haven't really thought of it in this, in this way. Uh, yeah, I know. Thank you. You guys are all asking questions about, uh, you know, uh, yeah. It's all about civility in the academic world. Um, thank you so much for coming. Sure appreciate it. And a very interesting presentation. I uh, do have a few things I'd like to, to sort of bring up that I made notes on. The um, fact is that we do still have a pretty powerful and well-financed military-industrial complex in this country. We have a $3 trillion budget for the military. Um, and so I think that that's a pretty important and interesting point that I understand that uh, it's uh, the defense budget is probably bigger than uh, any other budget uh, in terms of our in terms of our government. I think that you've used a lot of emotional <coughs> language today, and I'm sure that that's you know intended to you know who you're speaking to, you know who your audience is. You know, mostly uh, most of us who study economics here are you know are trained in the neo uh, econ school, and um, so. I understand that. I'm, I'm looking to break that. You know, my whole point is to study this and then subvert it entirely. Um, but and I think that that's, I'm not the only one in this room that has that attitude, but I'm willing to say so. Um, and then, so this whole emotional thing of command and control, centrally planned, bad, 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 like Dan Carvey. Um, and then capitalism, good, good. You know, and it, I mean, it's just, it's very emotional, incendiary, inflammatory. It's intended to just sort of bring your audience in, the audience that you know you have here, and speak to them. And um, so, I mean, it's just, I don't know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by talking about this left-wing commie environmentalist thing. I know that that was a joke. I know it was intended as fun. But the fact is, the environment, you know, is, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling you how important the environment is, okay? Um, and I also believe that you started out by saying that we'll leave ethics and humanity and morality out of the data. I think the data is completely skewed and biased without, uh, without trying to measure those 
without trying to attach some sort of um, method of measurement onto those things. So I think that's that that's important. Um, and I think that might be about it. Uh, but in terms of Milton Friedman, um, who's like such an icon of, of uh, you know, uh, free market economics in our country and around the world, he actually advised Pinochet, he advised Argentina, advised Bolivia, advised the South American dictators, created the kind of um, uh, dictatorships and tyrannies uh, in, in South America that uh, caused so many people to die and to, and to suffer today. So, you know, all that stuff needs to be taken into account in terms of these kind of, you know, when we talk about economic freedom of the world, it, it, freedom is, is far more than just uh, who, has, who, who has the most rights and who has the most money, because most people, most people, are, are, most people in the world uh, are, are suffering deeply from, uh, from these kind of policies. So, that's it. Is it? Can I can I have a quick reaction? Because there's a lot there's a lot there, and I, I appreciate it all. Um, uh, you know, just a couple of quick th re responses, and I appreciate the, the remarks. Um, I think we actually might be closer on the military thing than you appreciate, uh, although Social Security is larger than the Department of Defense. But uh, as a matter of fact, but leaving that issue aside, uh, I think it's unconscionable. In fact, the U.S. is a huge outlier. The U.S. is both a capitalist country, relatively speaking and a democracy, uh, relatively speaking. And uh, it is extremely warlike. And so the, contra Eric Garsky, the United States is the one very big outlier in his, in his analysis. So you have to understand, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's a, tra it's, a, it's a shame. I'm embarrassed to be an American on that front. Now, um, I think your Friedman thing at the end is 100, 100, 180, just completely wrong. But I, I want to actually address the emotionalism thing. Because I, I actually, um, you're, you're right, I, 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 undergraduate lectures, it's usually more effective to be a little flippant and, uh, and fun. Um, but actually, if one of the things I've learned from this project that I, I, it's taken me some years to de develop an appreciation for, is how s much more civilizing it is when we talk about data. Uh, what was uncivilized was those arguments in the 80s with my friends. Those were heated. I mean, people got angry at each other. Uh, and so not only was it uncivilized and angry and just, you know, didn't come to blows, but it was also unproductive. It really didn't seem to advance the, the, argue, the debate. Whereas I really do firmly believe that when we talk about numbers, um, it changes the tone of the debate in a way that takes a lot of the heat and ideology out of it. At the end of the day, there's still going to be, an, there's going to be a judgment call. You're, and, and that judgment call is normative and ethical and, and so forth. At the end of the day, you have to come down and say, OK, I like this. I don't like that. You can't avoid that ultimate judgment call that human beings have to make. But in the process of getting to the point where you're going to make that judgment call, uh, my experience is that, that looking at numbers and, and, and is, has been incredibly civilizing. It's taking a lot of the anger out of, out of it. Um, and when I engage uh, people who, I, um, who don't see the world exactly the same way I see it normatively, um, I think it's I'm much more comfortable. I think it's much more civilizing talking numbers. So um, at the end of the day, people are not always going to reach the same conclusions, even when we look at the same set of numbers. But I think it's, it's a much more productive way of engaging uh, each other as we, we debate these questions. Then the old days where we just argued, you know, you're a commie, you're a greedy bastard. That was the sort of the tone of the old debate. Whereas uh, now it's, well, you know, what about income inequality? What about war? What about you know, these things? I think it's a much more uh, fruitful and civil debate that way. Is that the hook? Uh, along with your index, I uh, also know that uh, the Heritage Foundation and Freedom House also produce indexes similar, relatively similar to this. I was wondering if you have any criticism of those that led to uh, your specific index? Uh, well, the, fr the Freedom House indexes are, I have no criticism at all. They're, they do political and, economic, or political and civil liberties. We do narrowly defined economic. So I look at them as companion, fellow travelers, and I use their data extensively in my research. And 
Uh, there are other data out there that do, like Polity 4, which is a good data set too, but uh, it does political stuff. Uh, with respect to Heritage, though, that they are a competitor with, with me, um, and so take everything I say with uh, the appropriate grain of salt. Um, the Heritage Foundation Index started at about the same time our index did. We were running sort of parallel paths. Some of the participants uh, that started their index actually participated in our series of, of develop projects that led up to the ARPA index. So there was a lot of overlap in, in terms of personnel and so forth. Ultimately, they decided to do an index, and we decided to do an index, and we've been going separately since. Um, needless to say, I think Mars is better. And, you know, that's <coughs> going to be obvious. But the big difference between the two indexes is that ours is, is, is this transparency and data-driven aspect of it, where you open up the book and you just see gobs of numbers and citations. So you, you know exactly why India got that number. And it's because this underlying number from this source was this. And so, and the formulas are all in there. So ours is a very transparent, open, data-driven exercise. For better or worse, the Heritage Foundation's index is more of a, if I'm uncharitable, I call it a beauty contest. But what it is really is a, a, an expert panel, a, peop, a group of people at the Heritage Foundation. They read a lot of data. They look at a lot of the same things we look at. But they don't have a mechanical process for going from raw data to a final index. They sort of sit in a room, they look at a lot of things, they talk about it, they argue, and then they say, it's a four, okay? And so my criticism of them is that it's, it's at the end of the day, they have a much harder time justifying their index because it, it really was sort of a panel of experts that, that arrived at it. To be fair, they're usually pretty good. I mean, they have Hong Kong number one, two, and, you know, and Zimbabwe is pretty much dead last. Now there is an advantage to their approach. The advantage to their approach is they can put Hong Kong or they can put North Korea in there. I can't put North Korea in there because I don't have the requisite hard data to do so. But let's, you know, if you're at the, if you're doing it with a more of a panel of experts sort of let's read everything we can read about about North Korea and put them on a scale. Well, yeah. You know, 180 out of 180 or whatever however many they have. Uh, it's an easy call. So the advantage of theirs is that they they can rate more countries than we rate. I think they rate about 180 some, we are 140. So there are some trade-offs in the two methodologies. Um, scholarly, scholars tend to prefer our index. If you look at the academic literature, we get a, a lot more attention than they do. Uh, I have to be, the Heritage Foundation has also got a lot more funding than, than we do. And so in journalistic circles, you'll see a lot more, I think more references to them in like newspapers because they just have a much more sophisticated PR staff and, and that's not a bad thing it's just that we're, we're a bunch of egg ed academics we don't you know we don't think about press releases and, and, and things like they do so. um, I, I think it's safe to say with the direction of history we the centrally planned economies that are have been largely discredited, you know, for the Soviet Union, the direction of China and all this kind of stuff but that doesn't by default validate like if it's Marx and Adam Smith, that, that seems to be like a false dichotomy in a way. So uh, I, I guess within free market capitalism, you have examples of, say, like Steven Spielberg, Oprah Winfrey, who have had years where they've pulled down legally over $100 million, which is 2,500 times $40,000, which let's take that as a median productivity for a person. I can accept that. In a, in a competitive economy, somebody could be two, three, five times as productive as the average person. Not, not as, as productive as someone who's living under a bridge and not even in the economy, but as the average person. 2,500, though, seems to me preposterous on its face. So I, I guess my question is how, how do you validate a system that validates that? Because it just seems to me absolutely preposterous. Um, well, Oprah is 25,000 times more productive than, than me. I'm teaching 60 people right now, and she will teach 60 million today. I mean, uh, so, I mean, <laughs> the fact is these, these superstars touch a lot of lives, and if you sort of say, what's it worth to every one of Oprah's, you know, every one of her, uh, her viewers, you know, a quarter. If, it's a, if, if each of her viewers only likes her to the tune of a quarter, uh, add that up, and she, she's, you know, 
if my students like me at $10 a piece, I still don't even come close. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think I do, by the way. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the fact is these people are highly productive, as demonstrated by the choices of, of, of the customers who, who they serve. Um, you know. Uh, what about professional athletes? Yeah, again, well, they're going to, you know, the baseball player gets two and a half, you know, the average baseball team gets two and a half million people paying tickets to go to get in the season, during the season. I mean, I teach 100 students this semester. Uh, so, um, you know, it, at the end of the day, I mean, the way the market economy works is people's earnings are based on other people's willingness to give them money. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, that's how market economies work. And Oprah Winfrey has convinced, without force or fraud, a lot of people to give her money, indirectly perhaps through the customers who watch her and then the advertisers who pay her sponsors and so forth. But, and the baseball player is the same thing. Um, I personally see that pr I see nothing ethically wrong with someone being very good at convincing lots of people to give them money as long as they don't use force or fraud. Um, it's shocking, but you know, uh, I'm afraid it doesn't offend my sensibilities like it offends yours. But that's, uh, I, I mean, I, I know it offends a lot of people's sensibilities. I appreciate it. I don't discredit it. It, doesn't, it really doesn't bother me um, that much. Uh, I do get bothered when kings and queens have that kind of wealth because they don't acquire their, kings get a lot of people to give them money as well, but they don't do so voluntarily. They steal it. They threaten people with imprisonment. Uh, and that's a completely different process that I do have an ethical concern about. So I guess my, my thought was that people like Oprah and Alex Rodriguez are on an economic basis benefiting from some type of an anti-competitive situation which allows them to redistribute income at no cost to themselves, because it's part of the competitive system, so it's cost-based. Her costs are not 2,500 times as much as my endorsement. So therefore, by definition, she's probably benefiting from some manner of income redistribution via non-competitiveness. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, it's clear that she, she, is, she is, in economics terms, she's earning rents. Um, she's earning a rate of return on her human capital in excess of what's necessary for her to stay in business. And that's because she has this unique skill um, of talk or whatever, and Rodriguez has this unique skill of being able to hit a ball 500 feet or something. Uh, and that is not competitive. As tr I, I really was, a, I wanted to be a baseball player. I grew up in Cincinnati, so I'm a huge baseball fan. I mean, uh, but try as I might and hard as I worked, it wasn't going to happen for me. And uh, most of us end up in environments that are more competitive. She, they earn rents. They earn rents. Market economies tend to dissipate rents, um, but not 100% in every case. Uh, yeah. Okay, one more question and that's it. I was going to ask about another banking crisis, just China's banking system in terms of today. Is that something that you might even want to touch upon? Is something you can pass off? You said just their reformation and taking up the toxic assets in 2004 to reform. They have a, a government that is their banks are owned by their, the state. You know, yeah. And then they're kind of making fun of us. And that was the G20. That was a big argument. Right whether or not we're going to be able to do that without controlling our banks. Right. Um, the answer I have is not really China specific, but there is a considerable amount of empirical study in finance about different banking systems and the performance of those banking systems. And it's not even a close call empirically that state-owned uh, uh, banks um, and economies, that, uh, banking systems that are dominated by state-owned banks uh, do, do not have efficient, uh, you know, financial intermediation systems. I mean, they, they do not. They have more financial crises more frequently and deeper. Uh, so China may be smug, but the evidence around the world is exactly the opposite. My colleague, Jim Barth at Auburn, is, is probably the best guy in the world on international banking regu regulations. And, I guess their only point is that they're just posting the best returns yeah. in the world today. Well, it's one of the best. And I, I just wonder what it's easy to post the, for that is because they control the events and they do so. I mean, it's also the fastest growing economy in the world. It's pretty easy to have good returns when you're investing in China uh, in the last tw 20 years. So, um, you know, again, but the problem is, you know, the, the, the state owned enterprise debate or state owned bank debate isn't just China. I mean, a lot of African countries have state-owned banking, and a lot of, a lot of the poor uh, Indonesia get a lot of state-owned banks. 
and you know, if you study the whole world and try to generalize from the available data, um, state-owned banking systems uh, have, again, more financial crises more frequently and deeper, uh, and they have less, uh, less credit flowing through this. It's just a, everything, every measurable aspect of the fish sort of efficiency of the banking system. So. <laughs> we'll be fine in the end. <laughs> so. I don't know how long the, in the long run we'll be fine. I just don't know when the long run happens. All right, I would like to thank you, uh, Bob, for coming to give us a talk.